going beyond the headlines. Asking the questions you want answered. Exploring government policies and how they impact you. We are delving deeper. Good evening and welcome to Delving Deeper. I am your host, Ayana Carter. Two Mondays from today, August 14th, Trinidadians will be heading to the polls to vote in the local government elections. So joining us on set to discuss these issues as well as local government reform and any other issues that we may be seeing on the hustings is the Honorable Faris Al-Rawi, Minister of Rural Development and Local Government. Good evening, Minister Al-Rawi, and welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me and the listening audience um, on Delving Deeper. Looking forward to a very engaging conversation. Now, Minister, before we get into local government and the issues that are happening on the hustings, let's take a look back at the flooding that happened recently in South Trinidad. Now, you mentioned that that flooding is not usual for that area. So what caused that flooding and what is the assessment since then? Sure. This is a continuation of the events that happened last year. If you recall in November last year, we as a government came out and told the population that the World Meteorological Office had informed the world that this year would experience severe weather patterns, very high temperatures and significant rainfalls in periods that, that are going, going to be seen, right? Spot on. If you look to the, you know, to the North, you look to Europe, you look to the United States of America, you're seeing Texas with over 55 degrees Celsius in temperature, etc. In Trinidad, in San Fernando, we had five hours of continuous rainfall at high tide. And that five hour period resulted in floodplains flood being occupied by water. The Navette River, the Guaracara River, the Cipero River, in the flood areas that normally have drainage, these areas were severely impacted by the water levels. In some areas, the water level came up quickly within half an hour to 12 feet of water. What causes that and how do you treat with it? What causes that is the rapid runoff rate in urban areas now. Remember that our drainage systems were built 100 years ago. Everybody's roof drains from three feet down to its point into four gutters all at once. And every neighbor's roof hits the same drain at the same time there is no longer green space to absorb water. So if you go onto Google Maps, you look at an aerial view of San Fernando, you'll see it's covered with roofs. The green spaces, we have our Skinner's pa Skinner Park and a few little areas here and there. That volume of water coming at you all at once means that you're gonna get this type of position. The persons who were affected were people who were in the flood zone areas. In one instance where we saw severe flooding, a neighbor's bin had blocked the drain. The drain was clear, the river was dredged, the works were there, but when your neighbor is not interested in spotting a bin, and the neighbor told us, yeah, I saw the bin for about a week and I just left it there because it's not my business. In today's world, it's everybody's business. But this issue of flooding was addressed by 250 CPEP workers, all of the corporation workers, disaster management unit, Ministry of Social Development. We were out on the field. We distributed sandbags, food relief, mattresses, and very importantly, we're processing the claims right now. Mm -hmm. This actually is very much a local government issue that is part of reform. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that urbanization is essentially one of the, the issues that is affecting the flooding in that area that affected with, that? With urbanization and with people having occupied state lands. So some of the people who were very affected are squatters on state lands at the bank of the river, where the river has to spill over. There's no amount of preparation. You're building on state land at the bank of the river. When the flood comes to the point where the flood plain has to be occupied, you're gonna see these kinds of things. The Ministry of um, Public Utilities and WASA are engaged in a number of discussions the Ministry of Works and Transport with the IDB and other entities where urban techniques are going to have to be applied. Water harvesting, 
encouraging people to take the water off of roofs into tanks before they hit the drains. That allows you to use watering for gardening, for other purposes, etc. But it slows down the rate of water because if you look at it, you'll see it from an aerial view. It's roofs. Mm -hmm. Literally 90,000, 100,000 roofs all draining within two seconds, all coming to the same point. Mm -hmm. So with the climate change factors, we're going to have to now invest. The world is now experiencing the same event. There's an investment in these alternative techniques. Yeah. But how are we going to address squatting on state lands then? Well, squatting on state lands is something that can be addressed and is part of our local government reform. So let's jump into local government reform yeah. because it ties into the two. We as a government have come to say to the people of Trinidad, we accept that there is bitter frustration and has been bitter frustration for decades in relation to the delivery of goods and services and relief from the local government corporations. That sounds fancy. What do I mean by that? Things take too long, people don't get it fast enough, mm -hmm. and they keep asking and they can't get it done. And usually it's an issue about, well, we just haven't received the money for it yet. So let's deal with the realities of local government. The realities of local government are, I'll give you the city of San Fernando as an example. Mm -hmm. San Fernando will ask at the beginning of the year for $100 million to run its corporation. The budget is, has to be spread across all ministries, etc. San Fernando in the year 2021 got $11 million. One retaining wall will cost you $4 million. Your entire budget is $11 million in your public sector investment program. How can you possibly perform the works? The ministry will receive $3 million for all the roads in Trinidad. We have 81% of the road network in Trinidad. So what is going on is an expectation of relief with absolutely difficult circumstances in spreading money. Remember, we have to employ people. So the vast amount of money that we give by way of government subsidy goes towards employment. You're paying wages. Mm -hmm. After you've paid wages, you need materials and you need mobilization. So you need plant and machinery, you need people, you need processes to get things done. There's a law to do it. The law tells you you could only look after things that belong to you. So in our local government package, we are addressing money, mobilization, manpower, and materials, four Ms. And in doing that, we are saying we are capable of delivering faster service by removing the need to go to Port of Spain to ask for Rio Claro to get a pothole fixed. Mm. We're removing the need to go to Port of Spain to ask for Icacus to get a drain fixed. Right there in the corporation, the corporation can take the decision itself to do the job. Right there in the corporation, they can use local contractors. Right there in the corporation, they can use the money that they gain from residential property taxes. Right there in the corporation, they can have control over the CEO who may not be acting as best as a CEO can. Right there in the corporation, we're gonna give you full-time counselors. So what does that mean? It effectively means faster delivery of services and more jobs with more money, mm -hmm. which means that the frustration that people feel, my light is blown, my drain is cracked and it's undermining my property. I can't pick up the garbage in neighbors overfilling here. They're rats and rodents. My children are at risk. That frustration that people feel, I'm driving my car and bam, I hit a pothole and my rim is broken. Those realities are realities because there's not enough money it takes too long to process. You have to go to Mars, Jupiter, and Venus before you come back to the place to get it done. So our local government reform package fixes that because it works in tandem with public procurement law, mm -hmm. which allows now the public procurement law gives the corporation the power to procure all that it requires. A highway, a dustbin, a paperclip, they don't need to come to the ministry to ask for permission to do it, they, all that they need to know is that there's proof of funds. Secondly, 
the ministry now hands the power to local government to hire people. People want jobs. If you go through Trinidad, you will hear people saying, I need a job. I don't want a handout. I'm capable of looking after my family. Well, you know what? With the ability to maintain schools, with the ability to have community centers now managed by local government, what we do is we have the ability to employ people right where they work because the public procurement law gives you the maintenance factor with the money. Now let's talk the money. Money that we're proposing, it takes cash to care, full stop. You could have all the champagne taste in the world. If you have a Morby pocket, you're only buying Morby. Worse yet, you might dream you might be window shopping and never enter the store because you don't have the money to do it. So we have said, I gave you the example of San Fernando asking for $100 million, mm -hmm. getting $11 million in 2021. By the collection of residential property taxes, by the corporation, the corporation collects it itself. It doesn't go to the Ministry of Finance, it goes directly to the corporation. We estimate that we can obtain $65 million more per year directly to the corporation. That $65 million is a contribution of people paying a dollar a day or $2 a day, at highest $8 to $10 a day for a super wealthy structure. But remember, because we're putting schools under local government for repairs and maintenance, the money that you used to give to MTS or to what used to be EFCL, that money also comes at you. So San Fernando, for example, mm -hmm. goes from $11 million a year to $110 million a year, which means that you can do it. Let's deal with frustration. I want my light, I want my light, I want my light. It's a security hazard. We're living in darkness here. That drain has undermined my property. I need it, I need it, I need it. These are real situations for people. Visceral, burning, trouble you kind of situations. We have developed technology in the ministry. We've, we've built an app called Local, L-O-C-A-L. It's already being tested in the field. Local allows everybody to log on with two-step authentication so that we could block out fake news. Faris Al-Rawi will be registered. So you know when you get a message from Faris Al-Rawi, it's Faris Al-Rawi. So you're not getting last year flood being reported today to go and mobilize an entire team to find out it's fake news. Mm -hmm. With the local app, we're going to have the ability for people to sit and report from their homes. And what they get in terms of response received, you know who is working on it, you know where it is, and you know what it's going to cost. This then allows a conversation with the nation. So let's say we roll out local tomorrow morning and we tell everybody, let's do some open source reporting. Everybody in Trinidad sign on to this app, it's for free, and report a blue street light. You're not relying on TN Tech to tell you the light is blue now, you're getting it from people where they live in. Then you have a conversation about the 50,000 lights that are blown because there's a bill that goes to it. It's like looking at a menu. You want steak, you want chicken, you want doubles. There's a cost on the right-hand side to the item on the left-hand side. And then we know how to allocate. So this package is a very complex and important package with the amendments to the Municipal Corporations Act. We also reintroduce the power of the corporations to go and fix issues that neighbors will not let other neighbors have relief on. You can't enter people's property. The grass 15 feet tall, the building covered with vine, they have rodents, they have vagrants living in the yard. Well, you know what? The corporation gets to go in, fix it and give you the bill. And if you don't pay the bill, there's a consequence. So this is a very involved, all the pieces put together structure. My job is to operationalize it. I drafted the law. I'm in this peculiar position of having drafted the law and all the other laws that work with it. And now I've been given the job to operationalize it and turn it on, which is a, an extreme pleasure for me. Now, Minister, do you get the feeling that people really understand, they, they are aware, they are interested in local government reform and what that means to them? I accept that in the latest generation, no longer X, now Z, we pass millennials, that 
millennials in particular have because of the manner in which they communicate, maximum 21 seconds of yeah. attention time. Get to the chase, they talk too long. What do you mean by that? So there is an instantaneous need to communicate in small bit-sized points. I don't think that people truly grab it because there is a lot of seeing is believing in this equation. I mean, a lot of talk about reform for decades. Yeah. In fact, since the Exchequer and Audit Act came in the 1950s and central government control went and took control of what local government used to do, where the county councils were replaced by the central centrality of Ministry of Finance, there has been this conversation. In the 1980s, when the THA model was born, mm -hmm. in 1996, in 1990, when the Municipal Cooperations Act was born and different iterations happened. I can give you the legislative history. People have been talking about it for a long time. Yeah. What we have done on this occasion, we've run a 99 meter race. We have one more meter to run in the 100 meters. There you have superstar athlete of the type like you see in Bolt, and you're about to tell him, stop on the line, don't cross the 100. Because no reform, as the opposition says, we don't support that, we don't support property tax, just give it to us. How you're paying for it and how you're getting it done and how you're reporting on it and how you're monitoring it and how you're ensuring that there's value for money and how you're ensuring local content so local people get the jobs. There's no conversation on that. There's only conversation on lighting it up. There's nothing else. So do people actually understand reform? Well, first of all, they have to care to understand it. So they want to see the effects of it. Mm -hmm. And when they see the effects, my philosophy in many things is just start. Once you start, there's now a line of sight. Hey, they got number one done. Well, what else they have coming there, boy? Maybe two, three, four, five? Yeah, they could do that. People need to have faith in something being done. I'm absolutely confident that this law is going to come and is going to have an effect. It will definitely tip the needles later down in a year or two, but people need to see to believe. Yeah. So for now, we could try and explain all we want. I just simply need to explain to people with this reform, you will get jobs that you've been lining up for. You'll be able to access employment to look after your family and hold your head up high. Mm -hmm. You will get service delivery much faster because I've explained. Service delivery comes with money to buy the materials. It gives us the manpower and you can hire and fire and discipline yourself for the first time ever. And that makes a difference. Mm -hmm. Now, Minister, you mentioned that this has been decades in the making, local government reform, something that we've been talking about. Why has it taken so long? UNC stands for the United National Congress. The deep form of local government reform, if you really wanted to get this thing, bang, you wanted to introduce Hulk into the equation. You wanted to bring Thor down with a hammer with lightning. You need some constitutional reform. So if we really wanted to give the maximum power in terms of reform, we needed a three-fifths majority, two-thirds majority, and three-quarters majority in the parliament. And they refused to provide that support. So we had to retool mm -hmm. into simple majority. But you don't draft law for yourself. Consultation was necessary. Mm -hmm. Because look at this local government reform. You could say the word reform all you want. What does it mean? For local government reform to work, you need property tax. For property tax to work, you need evaluation of land taxes. For that to work, you need the revenue authority. Mm -hmm. For the revenue authority to work, you need those three laws and the build out of structures. We in court on all of that, you know. Yeah. The union has us in court on the revenue authority. Yeah. The, the opposition threatened me while I was attorney general every single day. We go in Privy Council, they went Privy Council and they lost. In the case of Dominic Suraj, which upheld simple majority law. So we have had effectively a hundred percent of work, all of which has met with success to get it done. But we have an opposition that just is prepared to say and do anything to block us. And you don't need to listen to me. Listen to Marcus Gidari from Marabella South Vistabella, who was a UNC councillor, and in explaining his philosophical reasons for joining the PNM, said he could not swallow and tolerate 
Mrs. Prasad B. Sessa saying, listen, don't support, so they go feel. When he knew that these were the things to deliver to the people he was representing. And you can hear it. You listen to several of their persons who have said these things. But at the end of the day, I accept that politicians are a breed that people have, you know, not the best things to see. In fact, if you look at the ranking of people in terms of trust, you have lawyers and politicians at last and second to last. I happen to be both. I'm the subject of all sorts of jokes, etc. But I get it because as a representative of the people, people want to know that things are serious. As a representative in San Fernando West, I can tell you, my constituents very much understand what we are doing and are very grateful for what they are doing and they understand it. Mm -hmm. You mentioned trust. You mentioned trust earlier when we were talking about persons really coming on to this Luca government reform, the idea of it. So if people don't trust the persons in charge to get it out there and to really start and get us over the line, how are you going to address those people who don't trust politicians, who don't trust the process, who don't think that this is going, nothing is going to happen where, where reform is concerned? This is a democracy which has embraced the fact that we differ on opinions. The PNM is the government today. The UNC used to be the government on the last occasion. They won the elections. They didn't win with 100%. No party wins with 100%. You will always have dissenting voices. It is prudent to listen to the voices to see what is being said, because you ought to. So the fact is, how do you get people to trust? You have to just start. When I was pushing and championing the use of virtual courts, when I took the criminal division bill, the UNC brought some senators in who said, you'll never have a virtual court. Nobody would give up going to court today. Everybody online. Prisoners stay in the prison and go online to court. How come you don't hear about that? There was a protest led by the UNC outside the Hall of Justice. The union was outside the Hall of Justice, Mr. Watson Duke, protesting the criminal division. Today, the criminal division in full swing on virtual courts. Just start. Because my attitude was just deliver it and people will begin to see the merit of it. We used to have 15,000 people every three days in the Ministry of Legal Affairs. For me, that was a golden pot because it is the repository of Trinidad and Tobago. You could track crime, you could track records, you could track wealth. We digitized it. Mm -hmm. And while we were digitizing it, people said, you'll never digitize it. We're the first ministry in the Caribbean to be digitized that way. And the first ministry in the Caribbean to go with online payments. And now we see 500 people a week in person. Mm -hmm. So I have faith that if you put your head down, your shoulder to the wheel and your work, you will soon get the support mm -hmm. that is required. Now, following the August 14th election, uh, Diego Martin and Separia, they would be electing their first mayor. Yes. What are some of the other changes that you could just briefly give our viewers uh, what we could see coming after August 14th? After August 14th, you begin to see the operationalization of the engine, the collection of property taxes into the structure, the move to full-time councillors, the public meetings, the Audit and Accounts Committee, which are chaired by the minority, meaning the people that are not in charge, chair the Audit Committee to make sure the people who are in charge are doing the right thing. The use of standing committees. After that, you're going to see jobs created because now you can hire people with the public procurement laws, especially with the amendments that say that subject to the regulations, the methodology for procurement under a million dollars will be different because you need to move fast, right? These are therefore summarized into jobs and faster delivery of services. That is a huge position. Listen, it goes to crime and security too, you know. The municipal police under section 48 of the Municipal Corporations Act are put into local government. We have 823 municipal police right now, and we're gonna move them to another 531 shortly, adding on to that number. The municipal police have full powers of the police. And with the digitization that we have done, you will now be able to tell where your municipal police are. Are they two minutes away, seven minutes away, 10 minutes away? But remember, the government amended the Evidence Act. 
so that CCTV evidence is now primary evidence. And by asking communities to virtually gate themselves where people's homes have CCTV cameras, we're now able to look at CCTV evidence and not come and say, listen, Faris, we needed to come and tap the fellow on the shoulder and say, die the man who thief. Or he held me up at gunpoint. And therefore, crime and security gets a better chance and fight as well. You see, local government effectively is a universe in and of itself. They have police. They have sanitation. They have public health. They have building plans. They have enforcement provisions for people who are squatting. But to do that, you need to vest the lands. There are a lot of orphan roads where people are not getting services or orphan communities because the vesting orders have not been brought up to date. They are ready now. So you're going to see a huge difference in the two years ahead of us. Mm -hmm. And by the way, on August 15th, the government of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago will still be the PNM. Now, Minister, you mentioned the municipal police and, you know, crime and criminality has been on both sides of the political hustings, the both major sides of the political hustings. And you mentioned just about, about 1,500 or so, give or take, the 800 and then the 500 plus um, who have been employed under the municipal police. Is that enough to cover the communities? And are they equipped enough to deal with what is going to happen in these communities? Crime and security is a multifaceted entity. After lightning strikes, thunder rules. So an event happens, criminality goes to work, the police have to come in, in home invasions, etc. Recently, I had a personal experience. Um, my in-laws were victims of gunpoint um, invasion, but the people were caught by CCTV cameras in the neighborhood and by action. The police were describing to me that, look, we've caught eight guys already, but nobody wants to come and give evidence because they're afraid. Sure. So you have manpower and you have successful police activity. What you have right now, the thunder to rule is in a courtroom. A courtroom requires evidence. Evidence requires witnesses, which is why, as a government, we were so strongly in support of witness protection, witness anonymity in certain special circumstances, whistleblower legislation, cybercrime legislation, none of which the UNC supported. I want to remind you, we're seeing firearms as a tool. I moved that if you are found in possession of a firearm once, that you should show cause why you should get bail. You reverse the burden. That has fallen apart. So we have an opposition that believes that once Trinidad is in flames and Tobago is equally burning, that they succeed. But your question was whether the municipal police have enough resources. Yes. And the answer to that is yes. Because the municipal police actually have a resource base that is much larger than you expect. Because municipal police, unlike the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, have BACOs, corporation equipment, 9,000 daily paid workers as aid to enforcement, meaning if you have a roadblock that's going on and there are things burning anyway, who come in to move it? When the TTPS reach there, who moving that? The corporation has to come and move it. So we have a mobilization structure that is different. But our targeting with the municipal police is very different. Municipal police are meant to be the home police. They know your neighborhoods, they know your structures. Let's take San Fernando West as an example. San Fernando West is comprised of 25,000 electors. 11,500 of those people are split between 8,500 of HTC um, residents and 3,000 squatters. If the municipal police target residential areas alone to make sure that families are okay, the compound is safe, those things happen, you're going to have a suppression activity happen because at least there's a presence. So our targeting with the use of municipal police and by amendments to the Municipal Corporation Act to remove things like taking every matter to court, a market violation does not have to go to court, it can be a fixed penalty ticket instead. So there are some tweaks and maneuvers 
to make sure that what we have is adequate. Yeah. Now, Minister, I find that you're staying in San Fernando a lot eh, when you're giving your examples, right? I'm the MP for San Fernando. Well, well yes, I know this, right? But, you know, okay. Well. But it applies anywhere else. <laughs> yeah. Crime in San Fernando is the same as crime in Port of Spain, as crime in any carcass. But I'm giving you an example. So the municipal police in Port of Spain have the 200 in, in, sub, in strength and 200 in San Fernando because they're cities. But what do municipal police do? What makes them different from SRPs, Supplemental Police, or TTPS? Mm -hmm. It's the targeting. Minister, how do you respond to state companies who argue that a lack of funding is responsible for the non-maintenance of drainage and roads? Dredging is usually the description that we use to major water courses that fall under the Ministry of Works and Transport, where mechanized equipment has to go in and physically desilt, etc. For our part, we have to deal with drains and other positions, gully sucking, the underwater water courses, maintenance of, of drains, etc. Roads in Trinidad and Tobago are managed as follows. Under the Highways Act, the Ministry of Works and Transport has vested in it every single highway. They're actually listed in a schedule to the law. Mm -hmm. That comprises 21% of our roads. The rest of it is local government, the secondary roads. Currently, the Ministry of Works and Transport manages all roads because the secondary road repair company, Pure, which is a division of the Ministry of Works, they manage that entire network. What we have at the municipal level right now, in what is vested in us, what we have is a structure of putting on maintenance and repairs. What is different under the reform, because they can procure for themselves, because they can hire for themselves, they will be able to spend $10 million and buy a batching plant. Mm -hmm. And an asphalt supply can therefore mean that the local corporation can go and fix its own potholes because it has the power to procure the services and hire local people to do it. So one of the takeaways from the local government reform will involve that sort of phenomenon, fixing roads by the local corporation because they have the ability to do it. Okay. Now, Minister, what continues to be your challenge as, as Minister of Rural Development and Local Government? And what are some of your successes, some, you know, what you would consider the successes under your leadership? I've been in office for 15 months, 16 months in Ministry of Rural Development and Local Government. Um, some of the successes, if I start on the positive side, involve the digitization of the ministry, making sure that we move to online platforms so that we can introduce things like work from home. How on earth can you work from home if all your paper is in the office? The Ministry of Rural Development and Local Government comprises, including CPEP, 30,000 people. So you need to manage 30,000 people effectively. The use of technology is very important with that. So the apps that we're developing, etc., they allow us to have the return of personnel on your phone. So the road supervisor controlling 60 people can tune in from the road with a location pin and a picture to show the works that they're doing so you're sure that the works are actually being performed. That has involved a significant amount of success because that story is yet to be told publicly, but we've developed it. The other successes is in managing the procurement cycles to shorten the procurement cycle right. because economic activity and wealth in a country happens when the government is spending. If the government takes a year to spend something that could be done in a week, it means the service is a year long as opposed, a year away as opposed to a week away. So we have been shortening that fuse to that economic explosion. It's what I call the burn rate, and we have developed that. So we've had a huge success in shortening the time frame for these factors. The manpower is critical to be thought of as one. You can't think of it. Before I told you that local government was 30,000 people strong, you probably didn't know that because nobody's been reflecting on local government as a whole entity. It's municipal police, it's the 14 corporations, it's rural development company, it's CPEP. CPEP has 9,000 workers. The daily rated workers are 9,000 in number. You have 18,000 people cutting grass every day. Do you feel as if you have 18,000 people cutting grass every day when you see grass 12 feet high? 
So you have to manage on the basis of data. So we've introduced a data structure, which then feeds a conversation. It's what you call heat mapping. So we know what's working, what's not working, etc. In terms of trials and tribulations, money has been a perennial problem or value for money. Those are being attended to by the public procurement law and by the supplementation of revenue through property taxes at a very modest rate of a dollar a day, two dollars a day. So that has been it. Making sure that jobs are filled. What's the point of having 9,000 daily paid workers if you have no road safety officers to supervise them? So the filling of critical positions has been an issue. That is to be dealt with under the local government reform because the law now allows that to happen other than through service commissions. So we have identified issues and we've mapped them with solutions. Minister, CPEP falls under your ministry. A few months ago, the public accounts meeting of the parliament revealed that there had been no audits completed for the state companies since 2009. How do you respond to that? Bottom line is that they indicated that they were waiting on the external auditors, that the accounts will be, were prepared, as far as I'm aware. The management accounts are on the inside and they will just be produced. Remember, this is part of reform, you know. Let me touch auditing of accounts and CPEP and let me relate it to something else that is equally relevant. Mm -hmm. All corporations have unspent balances. Shogunas had $7 million in unspent balances. The mayor for Shogunas up and down all over Trinidad. I need um, chillers and the market need repairing. We have no money. We have no money. Well, yeah, you're sitting on, on $7 million. What you doing with it? We went and we audited because they could not procure an auditor to do the audit of the unspent balances. So the $7 million were right there. When Dr. Sami was complaining, the whole of Penal, they were going to shut down. We don't have diesel. They had unspent balances that they could spend there. It's the same issue as CPEP. Where are the auditors? Under the local government reform and with the amendments to the act, you can go and hire your own auditor mm -hmm. and produce it and bring it forward so that those things will be a thing of the past. But remember, we don't need to rely on putting, in putting all our eggs in that basket. We have the public procurement law with challenge proceedings and transparency at the OPR. So beyond the Auditor General, beyond the Ministry, beyond the Ministry of Finance, you now have the OPR, the Office of Procurement Regulation. So we are not saying don't check us, we're saying check us three times. And if you don't have the manpower, go and hire it. Now let's go back a little bit to um, security in communities. Uh, what assurances can you give to members of the public who understandably are concerned about their security within their communities. The assurance that I wish to give is that if people in the public stand up for the legislative agenda that we're pushing, that you'll get relief. What do I mean by that? This country is being held to ransom by a few groups of people. Let's call them 2,000, 3,000 people who are terrorizing the country with firearms. When we dealt with kidnapping for ransom, you remember when kidnapping for ransom was an issue in this country? Yeah. What stopped kidnapping for ransom? How did it go to zero? How did that happen? It was the bail amendments that did that. The kidnapping um, for ransom was dealt with. And the bail amendments were given that said, if you are charged for kidnapping for ransom, no bail for you for 60 days. And if your case start one year, whoosh, the phenomenon went away. How? Because that law went to work. When Mrs. Pasadbi Sessa came in as prime minister, 60 days wasn't enough. It went to 120 days. As soon as they become the opposition, anti-kidnapping and bail fell flat. The bail amendments that they refused to support reverted our law to the 1994 law because we required the UNC support to deal with restriction of the right to liberty. It's a three-fifths power. The only people standing in the way of a better version of Trinidad and Tobago, and I've given you an example where legislation was used to crush kidnapping for ransom. The only people standing in the way of a better life is the UNC. And I say that without fear of contradiction, because I've given you a live example. You need to take offenders 
off the streets and incarcerate them and have due process go to work. And what do you think people can do now to protect themselves? People need to rise up and understand that we can complain about the phenomenon. What's the solution? The solution that we are offering is follow the money. Because you can find people who are living beyond their means from a life of crime. The solution for us is stricter bail laws that reverse the burden of bail so that you have a harder chance of getting bail. If you, you have to explain why you have a firearm. Why do you have an AK-47? Why are you in possession of a 5.56 ammo type weapon? Why? Why are you on the road? Why is the UNC in the way of that? Why are these laws not being allowed to be passed? You see, these, if you use the kidnapping for ransom example, these bring home the solutions in a way that have worked for this country already. Mm -hmm. So that is the position because you could police every inch of this country, but you need to target what your real problems are. What are the real problems? Guns. What are the real problems? Gang activity. How do you prove gang activity? You could prove it by following money. And those are the things that we've put on the table, but the opposition won't pass. Now, I think, Minister, that's a, a good place that we could put a period here. So that's our show. Let me thank Minister Al Rawi for joining us on this episode of Delving Deeper. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be with you. Join us again at the same time next week for another episode of Delving Deeper. I am your host, Diana Carter, and from all of us here, have a good night. <laughs>